So good morning and welcome to the services at Valley View Church of Christ once again. Okay, this is like our uh, fourth or fifth time of doing this, and, and we may have several more that we have to do before normalcy returns to our lives. I, I find it a little bit humorous about what I miss. Uh, I, can, I can be almost um, funny with our, um, our routine. You could call it a rut sometimes where you could say, well, we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have announcements, we're going to have two songs, we're going to have a prayer, we're going to have three more songs, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, and then a couple more songs, and then we're going to have the lesson. And, and, and you can go like that, and you can think, oh, we do it the same every week, we need to change it up. But then you come to a time like right now, and I find comfort in being able to think in my mind of exactly how things go on a normal Sunday. And instead of it being a rut, it becomes... A powerful routine that brings stability and structure to life. And so today I've decided that um, we've decided that we're going to be as typical as we can. Uh, for those of you who attend Valley View, it's going to look very familiar to a normal Sunday morning. This is not just worship. This is your Sunday morning Valley View experience. If you're a visitor, a person who's not a member, and you're watching today, we welcome you to this time, but you're going to get a very real look at what happens on a weekly basis, starting from when you open your car door. We're not satisfied with just the worship. And so here you go. You get here on a Sunday morning, you climb that hill in your car and you find your parking spot. You start approaching the building to enter the assembly. Most often, it will be through one of two doors. You'll either be greeted like this, how you guys doing this morning? It's good to see everybody today. It's been a while since I've seen some of you. Some of you may be new to us, and we're glad you're here today. Hope you enjoy being with us today. Sure is good to see you again. Or you'll be greeted like this. Good morning. Welcome to the Valley View Church of Christ. We're all worshiping in different places this morning, but we're still all worshiping together. So glad that you came. God bless you. And come again. Depending on which door you come in. And then when you enter into the actual building itself, there'll be some very serious guys standing there. They are part of the security team. No one really knows it. They're very incognito. You could never tell that they are the security people. And invariably, once you get past one of those guys, there'll be another elder, a greeter or two in the foyer that will get your hand, or maybe at this time they would wave at you from across the room, before you ever enter the sanctuary. Hey guys, so Spencer asked us to talk a little bit about what we missed the most about not being able to be at church. Um, pretty simple for us, uh, it's the people. Um, the relationships we've got from um, the kids, uh, the same age as our kid, through the kids through the LADS program, um, the college group, and even on up past that. Um, we've got really, really good relationships with people there, and not being able to be around them has been difficult for us. Um, probably the biggest thing for me from a church setting is the difference in the singing. Um, singing with four or five people at your house compared to 600 plus people um, in the building uh, is very, very different. So I really, really look forward to getting back to that. Like Ryan said, we really just miss the people. I miss my three-year-olds in Bible class on Sunday mornings, um, crawling around like snakes and all sorts of things in the classroom. I miss the elementary school kids um, and how they're so brave and they're so willing to do things that I wish I had been brave enough to do when I was their age. I miss the teenagers and all the hugs that I get from the girls and all of them just helping me remember that things are going to be okay. I miss my college girls. Um, 
some of the guys, you know, not so much Gunner. And I miss having people at my house. We're not used to not having people around and we just really miss having people around all the time. Um, I miss our friends and all their kiddos and just getting hugs and um, I even miss Randy Carlton. I don't know how that happened, but it's true. And I'm just really looking forward to being back and being able to hug people and shake their hands and just smile at them across the building. It makes everything better. Yeah, we, we are. We're ready to be back. We hope this goes by pretty fast. So uh, we love everybody. We miss everybody. We hope to see you soon. Sure miss all my Valley View family. I'm just hoping when we get back together, I'll remember everyone's name. Be blessed now. Hey, good morning. We're glad you're here. No, you're not late. We just started on time this morning. Uh, Princess, give me five. Do I know y'all? Y'all just visitors with us this morning. Yeah, I know. Spencer's going to have a good lesson this morning. Only problem is we don't have a pause button. Captain's Log, star date 4293, April the 18th, 2020. It's the 9,000th day of our captivity. <laughs> this is Tony. He's Karen. She's the cute one. <laughs> <laughs> she really is. <laughs> Look, <clears throat> we miss, and she's going to go into this a little bit, what she misses, but and I get to go first since I started talking first. But it starts with A.J. Altum and it goes to Zane Gary. So that's A to Z. But specifically, I'd like to see Emma Randall. She brightens the room when she walks in. I like to see the energy of the children when they, when Spencer finally gets done preaching and they get to run up on behind the podium and play behind the curtains and all that stuff. So I miss the energy of that, but I also miss the camaraderie that we share with one another, with our faith, with what we believe in. And we, I miss the wisdom of Bill Harris and Bill Berry and everybody else named Bill. I like seeing Mike Coy's face. And I like seeing Warner trying to put Kathy in place. Doesn't happen, but she but he tries. And I can just go through the list. I mean, I miss Sheila Phipps, Carl, not you so much, but Sheila, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you know, we're learning what we miss. We knew we liked it. We knew we enjoyed it. We knew we was there for the right reason. But we're missing this because of everything. Well, I miss everything. Um, you know, the wonderful sermons, the, the people, uh, all my friends. Um, but specifically, I miss the education of our classes and everyone that participates in the classes. Um, you know, when I read through uh, verses, I think I understand and then the people speak up and and I'm like, wow, there's so much education that we're missing out on, um, you know, from classes and from the sermons. Um, and I, I just miss everything. I miss hearing the children's laughter in church and missing all of our friends and meeting new people every time we go. Um, so I just cannot wait to go back to church for all of it. That's all for now. See you next time. And you'll have conversations with people uh, all the way down till you get to your spot. And you know you have your spot. For some of you, that's a long walk because you go to the front. For some of you, like a Destiny Dials who sits down as fast as she can, you don't see many people because you rush to that back pew and you've already got your place. At some point then, as you uh, hear the cacophony of voices around you, people interacting and talking and catching up from the last time they saw each other, which the next time we meet will be a lot of conversation. You'll hear a song being led by a young person. We have a bunch of young people being trained not only to serve, but to lead the church um, in future times. And every Sunday we're started off with one of these young people. It's not to perform, it's to lead us. And this morning it happens to be Trey Fitz. 
And so here's his song. Today we'll be singing song number 144. One, four, fourth. O worship the key. We'll be singing all three verses. First, second, and third. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor, and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Then there will be the inevitable announcements, right? We have some people who are good at greeting, and there's a very few announcements maybe that need to be made beyond what's on the handout that you're given. And one of the best ever announcers is the best ever football announcer at ASU, not doing it anymore for football, but he still does it at church. And here is Buddy with our announcements today. Good morning and welcome to the services at the Valley View Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us this morning on the television or at home or on the internet, we hope that you enjoy the worship services this morning and enjoy Spencer's lesson. If you are visiting with us and looking for a church home, we hope that you'll consider the Valley View Church of Christ a place to worship. And if you're visiting with us this morning, obviously you don't have a card to fill out in front of you, but we'd like to know that if you've enjoyed our services, just let us know at the Valley View Church of Christ. There are several sick that we need to let you know about this morning. First of all, our, our hearts go out to Gail Holder as he continues to struggle with his illness. Please remember him in your prayers, not only today, but throughout the week. Also, we uh, have Gary James who had a little accident uh, down some stairs not too long ago. Gary's recovering. Uh, he has been in the hospital, he's got a pacemaker, and he'll be going home in the next day or two. Once again, we appreciate you attending today. Again, we hope you enjoy our worship service. Have a great day. So we cannot do exactly as we do in our assemblies. We can't, but maybe today you've just remembered uh, what it's like, that experience, the total experience of coming and being here. The service today is going to center on that Lord's Supper and why it's always appropriate, even in weird times, and even when you're doing it apart from full assembly. It's still very critical that you do this. And then we're going to outline how that supper makes a claim for the rest of this week. That when you take that here in a moment with us, it obligates you to a certain kind of life the rest of this week. You can't live just any way you want to if you're going to take that supper together. Uh, to lead us in our reading is Kate Hawkham, and then we'll have our message for today. Today, I will be reading Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit and affection and sympathy, complete my joy by having by being of the same kind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. 
and that every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're so grateful that you're here for this time of worship together. I would like to highlight a, a couple of things that, um, before we get started, Gary James recovering from a fall in his house, and we wish him a, wi- a quick recovery. Uh, but I, sure, I, I want to assure him what an amazing wife he, he has. She wasn't allowed to even go into NEA when they took, her, took him in, which so rattled me. We started talking uh, to her on the phone, and she handled herself just fine. She was talking about Gary, and she said she was a bit discombobulated. And I paused, and I laughed, and she was taken aback, and I said, No, no, Shirley, you sound just like Gary James. And she chuckled, and she said, Well, what do you expect? We've been married for over 60 years. Anyone who talks to Gary James very long knows that you have to have Google on your phone handy to look up the dictionary words of what he says. Gary is an octogenarian who is also a sesquipedalian who often waxes loquacious. So to hear his wife following suit was a little discombobulating to me too. And this week when an appeal was made uh, uh, from the St. Bernard's Village people, again, it seems like village people. It it sounds like I'm always talking about them, but they needed 16 face masks uh, to be made. And one of our precious young people, who loves to serve, got busy. She sped through her homework so that she could get to that sewing machine and make 16 face masks herself. And so I say to us as a church, and I say to Gentry for what she's done, thank you for your servant-hearted example. Thank you for living out Philippians 2 that was just read a moment ago. Your sacrifice of time and effort and energy And you've blessed this church and you've led this church in that example. It's a perfect segue into our lesson. But first, of course, we've got to sing. And so we will um, now. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. There should be something uh, a little refreshing about a home worship experience. Uh, But the longer this time goes on, the more important it becomes, but also the more the newness wears off. And the danger rises that we will become complacent and casual with it. We're still drawing near to God by His invitation. We're doing that from our homes. But given how familiar our home settings are, it can become very informal and seemingly not count. It fails to register maybe with us that this is really worship of the living God. It definitely is, but in our minds we get confused and it becomes difficult to let it be so. I think of the Lord's Supper the most. We're used to a couple of songs to prepare us together that we sing together, and then somebody leading us in a devotional thought about what this supper is. And then when the communion starts, it takes time to serve communion to 500 people. And as that time is going on, it gives you some some very unique time in your life to really reflect on your life and to think about what Jesus did. But when you're at home, when you're at home, it takes no time at all for for those of you gathered to take that that unleavened bread and and, and digest it, and it's over, and that's it. And you go right on to the fruit of the vine. And in, in no time, it's over. And I'm not saying it's... It's only time that determines whether it's effective or not. But this is valuable time that we can find ourselves zipping through too casually and not giving enough credence to evaluating our lives. The reading this morning from Philippians 2 is one of the most well-known passages of the New Testament. The way Paul wrote it feels backwards to me. He begins Philippians 2 with how we should behave. He says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, participation of the Spirit, I want you to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be be done through selfishness, but think of others first. He starts talking about how we should live, and and then he proceeds to say, 
Do you know why? You know why you should act out of this? This was the mind of Christ. This is the centerpiece of our doctrine that, that he, while he had every right to stay in heaven with God, he was willing to give that up, not for himself. It did him no good, but for us. He gave up what was rightfully his to meet a need that we had. That's why we live this way. It's the mind of Christ that, it, that prompted him to live the life of Christ and offer the sacrifice of Christ. And he's saying, because of that being the centerpiece of what we worship, we should live out of that same kind of mindset for each other. If we ever fail to remember what Jesus did, we will also fail to remember the kind of life we should live. It's connected to each other very closely. It's inevitable. And if you struggle with motivating yourself as to why you should bother living that kind of life, the corrective is to meditate on that doctrine and to remember. And one of the ways, one of the ways he perpetually decided to drill that into our brains is through the Lord's Supper, a weekly observance that's very tangible. It involves all your senses. He wants you to vividly remember this. Jesus knew that before, before He even carried out the events of the cross and was raised by the Father, He stopped everything and He had a meal in an upper room with His disciples. And He made them remember what these elements were for. And these elements are very mundane daily things. It would be a traditional Mediterranean meal except for the unleavened bread. These daily ingredients of life were to always cause them to remember. But on this particular day, in this particular time, he says, I want, you, I want you to do this act, this memorable, tangible act to generate memory. When we touch, when we taste, when we feel, when we hear, as we discuss it, as we see the things that make up the Lord's Supper, vividly comes to our mind the events they signify. And then he calls us to live our lives in response. You know, you have to go to some trouble to prepare for this, whether you go to the church building and the elders hand you the ingredients necessary or you make it in your own house. We can't get together without a little bit of trouble to go to it in order to observe this. There are two parts to this meal. One is memory. We're rehearsing. We're remembering details. We're reviewing the incident that Jesus carried out. This is a past event that's already happened, but it really did happen, and we must never forget it. It's why we are told in the Scriptures, and it's engraved on the front of our communion tables, this do in remembrance. You just go through remembering. Don't ever forget. That's part number one, but part number two is covenant. You're also rehearsing how you should live your life by the mindset of Jesus. As I leave this table today, I'm obligating myself to live out of that same mindset that Jesus did, to give up of myself to serve others. That's not my will, but thine be done is the centerpiece of that story. And that needs to be the mindset that we're rehearsing as we go through the Lord's Supper. This is future. This is not past. This is future. What am I going to do tomorrow and the day after that? You have an eye on that as you partake. As Jesus did, so must we do. So this morning, I ask that each of you, before you put it in your mouth, grab the take of, break off the unleavened bread in your hand. Pass it around the room so that everybody has it in their hand together. And wait for everyone to have theirs it is unusual, the unleavened part, and it's intentional. There's a meaning to this, the Passover background, but it's, it symbolizes taking all the worldliness out. We want, we want worldliness out. Jesus was in the world, but not of it. And we're striving to do the same thing. We're called to do the same thing. But it's His body. His body was every bit as physical as ours. He was limited to a physical body just as we are, and He lived among us, facing all the temptations we do, the limitations of His body that we do, and then He allowed it to be broken. 
with thorns, with beatings, with whips, with nails. All that you deserved, he took. Before you consume this bread, let's take a moment to think about what he did for us, and then we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you reflecting on what it must have felt like for you to watch your son carry out the events of that day, to see your son broken the way he was broken, and to know it was through no fault of his own, and he willingly did that for us. We see how his body was treated. We see how he suffered. And we see in that a picture of of the cost of sin, we see in that a picture of what we deserve. We see in that how much you must tremendously love us and how Jesus sacrificed for us. Father, we want to we want to follow the steps of Jesus to be in the world but not of it. That's why this unleaven is unleavened bread is so important. And we want to think about this as we've broken this bread as we've put it in our mouths and as we've broken it up some more and as we consumed it, we want to consume all of Jesus and we want to digest Him. We want Him to be part of our lives so that what comes out of our hands and what comes out of our mouths, what, what, what comes out of our walk is what we put in, the Jesus we believe in. We see how He lived His life and we see how He faced His death. And Father, we remember. And Father, we want a covenant this week to seek to imitate his example. Thank you for what he did for us, and thank you for being willing to offer him on our behalf. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now if each of you will take this fruit of the vine also, obviously the color of blood typically, the Old Testament says that the life is in the blood. It also says in Leviticus, I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves upon the altar. The blood of animals God gave as a gift to be able to atone for the sins of the people. But we know that the blood of bulls and goats doesn't atone for sin at all. But it was allowed to. It was a permission of God until the real sacrifice, the intentional, innocent sacrifice of a free will person was sufficient and powerful enough to really purge the conscience. And the only one who could do that was God entering human flesh himself and offering that blood, that kind of perfect, pure blood on our behalf. And so Jesus, after living a sinless life, allowed the blood of his body to be drained for the taking of atonement for our sins. It has the power to remove the guilt. It has the power to move, remove the power of sin in our lives. In our baptism, we made contact with it. And in the Lord's Supper, we remember it. And we remind ourselves and we renew our baptism for another week. That's what we're doing today. Before you consume this fruit of the vine, remember the sacrifice Jesus made. Appreciate, remember, and pray. Father, we are so grateful for your son again and for the blood that he shed. We see it everywhere. It was a bloody scene that day. And it was something that was not deserved except by us. But we get to avoid it because Jesus offered to take it in our stead. And as we consume this fruit of the vine that represents his blood, I pray, Father, that we'll take on a remembrance, that we'll taste a kind of bitterness of the cost that he paid, but we'll also remember that we're consuming it so that we can live out of that kind of sacrifice ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have kind of reenacted this reading that we've done this morning in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus modeled servanthood. He modeled giving his life in service to other people. And that's the heart of our faith. You've relived it, you've reflected on that moment, but you've also covenanted to imitate it in your life. It seems so odd the context we're taking it in. We're not in full assembly. 
It's the context of our daily lives. In some ways, that's so very appropriate. I want to look at two particular images, not, not related necessarily to the Lord's Supper, but it's two instances where table is mentioned and, and how powerful an image it portrays for us if we as Christians see it through the lens of the Supper. The first one you know well, and most likely you can recite it with me, Psalm 23. And if you feel so comfortable and inclined in your house, just go ahead and quote it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And I want to stop there. The image of shepherd gives way to the image of host. It's a strange change, but in poetry you can do that. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What the believer knows is that God is able to dine with you and commune with you and comfort you not after the storm is over and not after the enemies are eliminated and not after the war is waged. He can do it in the midst of the war. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love that image because that's kind of what we're doing. The Lord's Supper seems so strange, doesn't it? It seems so odd right now because we're not even able to meet. It's not a person that's our enemy. It's a virus that's our enemy. But there's something waging in us. And I think there's a lot of people who think, I'll take the Lord's Supper when? When I don't feel anxiety. When I don't feel the stress of life. When I don't feel like I've struggled with sin and temptation. When's that going to be, church? When is that ever going to be in your life? When's it ever going to be that you wait until things are right before you get things right with God and you commune with Him and you let Him remind you of what He's already done and what He's more than willing to continue to do? Do you know why it's so important to take it in your house when you can't get out? Because you need the reminder now more than ever what God's done for you and what He will continue to do. And then He goes on to say, He goes on to say, and he anoints my head with oil. I'm his special servant. My cup runs over. God's going to provide for me in abundance. And surely he's with me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. It's not saying I hope he is. It's saying I know he is. I need that reminder in the midst of the war. I need it in the midst of the stress. I need it in the midst of the anxiety. So the psalmist knows in Psalm 23, When I need the table set by God for me in my life, it's in the midst of the stress of my life, that reminder of who He is and what He's done for me and how He loves me and how I'm His. The only ones who can really partake are the ones who've committed to Him and know what He's done for them. And He's reminding you powerfully and you're reminding Him you're taking the mantle of that mindset with you. And how do you think that a believer who sat at that table and reflected on that care will return to his life among his enemies? Will it be a little more gracious? Will it be a little more kind, forgiving, and servant-hearted? He should. That's what it's for. This morning you've remembered, you've reflected, but you've also obligated yourself to live that way. There's another story that I want to recall to your mind. This one has... Luke is very intentional in his language of the Lord's Supper. Take, break, bless. That language is very particular. And he uses it the one time that doesn't seem to be the Lord's Supper, but it's peculiar, and I want to call your mind to it. We used an Old Testament example. Now we're going to use a new one. In the New Testament, there's a storm raging. Uh, It's aboard a ship on the open sea. They're taking Paul to Rome to face Caesar. Paul has warned them of the dangers of traveling at this time, but they ignore him. And now they are going into a sure explosion of the ship. It's going to fall apart. The angel of God has told Paul such. And he goes and he tells the people, "This we are not going to make this. This ship is not going to make it to shore. But listen, the angel has promised me this. If we'll stay with the ship until it's time, not one of us will be lost. They listen to him. They even cut the survivorships 
off the ship. No one's leaving. We trust what Paul's saying. That's crazy. That's crazy. But in Acts chapter 27, it continues this way. He says, you've got to stay with the ship and trust me, God's going to spare every single one of us. Not one of us is going to die. When he had said these things, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them, and broke it and began to eat. I'm not saying this is the Lord's Supper, but I'm saying for Paul, anytime you do this, it's going to remind you of the Lord's Supper, of God's providential care. What's it do of the other people? It says, they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. Why would you stop the crew, gather them all together, and pray for your food when a storm is raging and you're about to hit the open sea? Why would you do that? You need to be reminded God's got you in this. God's taking care of you. He's provided for you in the past. He's going to provide for you now. And it provided such incredible encouragement for the people on that ship. That language makes me think that in Paul's mind, it was a reminder of the Lord's Supper, even if it wasn't the actual thing. The elements of the common meal of that time were certainly helpful for thinking of it at other times. That's what we've done today. In the midst of this troublesome world, even as the storms around us rage, we're looking back at what God has done for us in revealing His love for us. Remember what He has done to love us and know that He will continue to love us and meet those needs. But remember, too, we get up after this meal and we live a certain way because we honor and reflect and look and study at that example. And we admire it and we worship it. We bow down before a Christ who gave that example and we seek to emulate it in our lives. There are a few things I think that this experience has taught us, some language that I think we need to do some spiritual application to. What do you do after the table? You've taken, you've partaken, you've remembered. What do you do afterwards? We've got this word going around called social distancing. It's a, it's a tactic that's being used saying you may have the virus and so stay away from people, even if you don't. But stay away from people and spare anybody from the possibility of getting it, yourself or them. I think about that and I think about how the Lord's, Lord's table is telling us to be unleavened bread. Be, don't, don't be worldly like, like the world. If you are around people, and there are people who have a power over you that, that you become less spiritual because you're around them, maybe you need to be practicing some spiritual distancing from people in order to honor that sacrifice that Christ made and the covenant that you just engaged in for another week. Maybe there are people you need to be careful of. Always gauge and monitor how they affect you. If it makes you less than like Christ, maybe you need to be distancing yourself. But more to the positive, thinking about the needs of others before our own, as Paul describes at the beginning of Philippians 2. We deny ourselves moving about freely. Uh, we are more than capable and healthy enough to get out there and move like everybody else and be around everywhere. But, but in order to love people properly, maybe you need to refrain from using your freedom. That is an imitation of a Christ-likeness. I see in Acts chapter 2 at the end of that, after all these people were converted and were baptized and, and, and they were added to the church, they sold their property. They lived like in a utopia. That is not a command for all of us. I don't think God expects us to live that way. He, he scatters people. I want you to go out there and share it with people. But there are certain contexts where that response would be appropriate. We're living in a time where some people have lost jobs and some people have been laid off for a time, and it's going to get tight for them. What does the church do? How does a believer who's observed the Lord's Supper and says, I want to have the mind of Christ and use what I have to meet the needs of others? What is a person who, who their job is just fine and everything's fine, but they know other brothers and sisters in the family who are not at this time? What would they do with a stimulus check they don't really need? What would a Christian do? Would the supper obligate us? Would the covenant we made with Christ obligate us to look after other people? And even during this, this next week and you do whatever you do during the day and, and you look through the church directory or, or maybe through your own mind and memory and you know there are certain people who are living alone. I don't know if you know this or feel this or not, but if you 
or in a family and you have people to talk to, while they might, you might get annoyed with each other, you have each other, there are people living in their homes by themselves completely isolated and you can absolutely go depressed in this time. What would it be like for you to take some of the time that you have to check on them in some way? Would that not be an expression of communion covenant? Would that not be something that Christians should do? These are things that you can do. These are practical ways of living out the mind of Christ that we're called to do on a regular basis. But now we have different opportunities and creative ones right in front of us. You've made a covenant, church. You've renewed that covenant to act out of the mind of Christ. And sometimes that will cause you to reach out and be generous with money. Sometimes it's be generous with time. Sometimes it's be thoughtful of others with your technology. It's any number of things. We need to do the same. We live in our lives honoring this doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But not just honoring that as an event, but living it as a mindset. You've had a table prepared before you in the presence of your enemies, in the midst of a storm, not in a church building with fellow believers around you, but at your home, with your family, right there where your life is normally lived. God is reminding you once again of His ability to care for you no matter what. And that reminder should produce gratitude and confidence and trust, but it should also lead to living out a life of service to others this week. Be thinking how you can live out the mind of Christ in your context this week. There's one other way we're going to try to be like a typical Valley View Sunday. I'm going to sign off and one of our shepherds is going to have a shepherd's prayer and blessing. And I hope this blesses your day. Have a great week and stay healthy. Good morning, Valley View. It's so good to be with you this morning. Albeit uh, through video presence, I'm certainly glad to be here with you. I feel your presence with me and with all of us and our longing to be together again, just as I think all of us really look forward to the time we get to, to be back together. We as your elders want you to know that your shepherds do not take lightly the fact that we're meeting, that we're not able to meet together. And we look forward to all being back together when we can. The physical and spiritual well-being of our congregation is vitally important to us and continually on our minds. We are prayerfully and thoughtfully pondering the impact upon all of us and want you to be encouraged to grow daily in your faith and in Christ. We encourage each of us to spend time in God's Word every single day. It's so good to hear of the many good things going on uh, with, for, and by many members of the Valley View congregation. Money has been given for, for tornado recovery in Jonesboro and Harrisburg. Really, up into the thousands of dollars have been given. Many have worked and served food in these areas. Many of you have made porch visits, kind of a new thing that we're enjoying getting to I see people in a different way, making phone calls, sending cards and letters and text messages to each other, and some have even shared food. I think in doing this, we are practicing what Paul said in Galatians, to do good to all people, especially those in the household of faith. And as Paul commended those who gave to help victims of the famine, we commend you for helping the victims of the tornado, the COVID crisis, and those who have lost their jobs. You know, this week, I hope that we can all be encouraged by the words of Paul to the Galatians in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This time we want to remember several of our members in prayer uh, as we go to the Father in prayer. Let's pray. Father, it's so good to 
be able to come to you, to pray to you, to talk with you about things on our hearts. And as we miss all being together, Lord, we pray that you will uh, find ways to help us bind to each other even while we miss each other. We thank you, Lord, so much for the way that you have been with Gary James through his fall and in his injury that he's been able to go home. And we pray that you continue to be with him in his recovery. Lord, we pray that you be with Gail Holder in all these difficult times of, of his health. We pray that you be with Brenda and all of his families. They take care of him. Lord, we offer a prayer, special prayer of encouragement for Derek Brown. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with him and strengthen and encourage him in his faith. Lord, we pray a special prayer for Billy Wills and the surgery that she's facing on Thursday this week coming up. We pray that you will be with her and her family as they struggle through this time. And pray that you be with Blake Lamberson and some health problems as he's experiencing. And Lord, there's so many others that we do not know of at this time that we want you to remember them as they struggle through the different struggles of health, through problems of sickness in this time, through discouragement and loneliness. Lord, there are some who have uh, suffered uh, through the tornado that we want you to uh, be mindful of and take care of, as well as those, Lord, who are struggling with uh, facing the loss of their jobs or cutbacks in their jobs. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will be with them and help us to find ways to take care of them. We thank you, Lord, for this fellowship here at Valley View, for all those who our members, all those who, who work here and are such an important part of this congregation, we thank you, Lord, for each one from young to old. Pray a special blessing upon each one as we go through this week. We love you, Lord, and we miss being together in this fellowship and look forward to that time when we get to be back together again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.